lecture chapter six, finding the right location for the business. And as we all know, location plays a significant role in the success of a company. And you will need to decide if you will build, buy, or lease, and which one of your largest you will also need to decide if you will build by our lease, which is one of your largest financial decisions in establishing your retail business. And with online retailing, the location of the business is no longer confined to a geographical site. Um, business location can be the destination where your catalogs are mailed, it can be the company's website, or it can be the brick and mortar store. And these are all business locations. And location is always directly tied to your target demographic because people of similar demographic characteristics within a given region tend to purchase similar goods and services. Also, the U.S. Census Bureau provides valuable demographic data in their reports, and you can see an example of that in your book. Also, the entrepreneur must define the target market before determining a location for the business because no matter if the location houses a brick, click, service, or catalog operation. Also, target demographics affect your image and who your customer is affects how other people see your business. So the location of the business affects your image and if you have an artsy downtown location, then people would assume that your store is kind of artistic, different, one of a kind. Um, if you look on pages 24 of your book, there is a um, insight into a, a store called Birdie's that is in the art district of Kansas City. And you can read kind of it about it and how they portray that image of um, the art district. So for this chapter, we're gonna focus on the brick and mortar physical location and not the e-commerce location. And we will look at the geographical location, the facility it's itself, and the design of the interior and the layout of your store. And we will specifically look at the e-commerce side in chapter seven. So looking at the location hierarchy, looking at the region, the state, community, and the site, your ultimate decision as an entrepreneur is to decide where the business should be located to maximize, maximize the likelihood of success. You need to choose a place that best serves the needs of your target market. And most times the location is limited to the area where the entrepreneur lives. But if it is not, your location um, selection may begin with a broad regional search that is systematically narrowed down to your region, state, city and community. And the first step is to explore different regions of the country that have the greatest number of characteristics necessary for your business to succeed. And some of these characteristics would be growth of a particular population segment that you're wanting to target. You would also look at rising disposable incomes. You would look to see if they have a stable economy. You would also see um, how much access you have to certain suppliers you're wanting to use. You'd also um, look to see um, if they have low operating costs in that region. You would also want to ensure there's adequate and affordable labor. And you also want to look at the level of competition of similar businesses, and you want a low level of competition. If you look on page 106 of your textbook, box 61, it gives you a location checklist of what you should research before determining your location. And another factor that you might even look into is climate. And an example of this would be, say you're wanting to open a ski shop, you would need to be in a climate or be near a ski mountain. So after you select a region, then you determine the state that you want to be in. And every state and city has a development business office designed to recruit businesses and to help them with researching the state. And the key issues that you want to examine are state laws and regulations. You also want to look at tax incentives or investment credits. You also want to look at the quality of the labor force, wage rates, and union status. And next, you want to look at the city. 
that you want to be in. And you want to analyze the city's population demographic and psychographic characteristics. And you need to look at the population density. So the population density is the number of people residing per square mile in an area because you need a high traffic volume. And residents tend to work or live within 10 miles of where they shop. So you also need to look at the competition within the city in terms of similarities and differences between your business and them and determine if you can capture a large enough share of the market to make a profit. So we've repeated this over and over that you're going to have to look at demographics and psychographics to make sure that you have um, the right target market there. But then the other big thing about your target market is it has to be a large enough market share and you have to be able to capture a large enough segment of that market share to make a profit. And next is the specific site. And there are six basic areas a store can be located. It can be a central business district, a first ring suburb, a neighborhood, a shopping center, a mall, an outlying area, and even one's home. But we will only look at the first four. So the first is the central business district. And this is the historical center of a city or a town. So it's where downtown businesses were first established in the early development of the city. So for Lubbock, this would be the depot district. Next is your first ring suburbs. And these are early stage communities that have come about as a result of suburban sprawl of, you know, a big city moving out. And so an example of Lubbock, the closest thing would be um, living in Wolford. And families live there, so you would see more children's and boutiques in this area and even spas. Next are neighborhood locations, and these are residential areas that are heavily concentrated. And an example of this would be the area by Rice in Houston. This is called the Medical District, and they have nice boutique shops in this neighborhood where there are large homes and families. And next is a power center, which is a shopping center with the drawing potential of a large regional mall with large specialty or department stores that target affluent um, baby boomers. An example of this would be La Quintera shops in San Antonio. And um, mall shopping has actually declined. So this is specified as not as a, as a good location to choose. And also you'll need to look at a location's occupancy statistics history and tenant turnover and leasing terms over the past few years to see, you know, have a lot of tenants been leaving? So why are they leaving? Or is it because their customers aren't coming there? Or is it because they're paying high rent? You want to find out those things. You want to find out the leasing terms. How long do you get the lease? Is it affordable? You know, can the lease change? Can they up the, the price of your lease? Um, so those are all things that you want to look at. Um, in this data, you can usually find these things from the Chamber of Commerce or the leasing director of the shopping center that you're interested in moving into. So before looking at the actual location factors, the entrepreneur must prioritize the qualities that are most necessary to the success of the business. And for entrepreneurs who sell products through a catalog or online, the following location variables will have a different priority than those entrepreneurs with brick and mortar stores will have. So the four different um, location variables are visibility, competition, neighborhood mix, and image, which will definitely be quite different from um, online retailing. This slide looks at some places to go for location information, specifically looking for location costs. And one is census data, um, and also another place to look for information is retail business information um, from the National Retail Federation. They compile annual data um, about retailers from across the country. And they present the data on retail store and online sales levels and trends. They also have data on employment and compensation levels and trends. They also have info on retail companies, profitability, size, and inventory shrinkage. Next is the index of retail saturation, and it can be used to estimate income and expenses for a location budget. 
and the index of retail saturation calculates the number of customers in a specified area. They also calculate customers' purchasing power and the level of competition. And this data can be found through the U.S. Census Bureau in the County Business Patterns Economic Profile and the Economic Census. Also, um, Chamber of Commerce's may also have this data. And I've given you some links to some of this information if you want to top them in and look at them. Also, the IRS is determined by the following formula that you can find on page 111 of your book. And that formula is you're going to take the number of customers in a trading area and you want to times it by the retail expenditures per person and then you divide it by the retail facility's total square foot of selling space. And um, when you take that, you can see from the example on page 111 at the bottom of the page that um, if you look at two different locations, the, the location that was better will be location one because it had a higher sales per square foot. And the industry average for sales per square foot is $175 per square foot. Next, looking at the National Retail Traffic Index, it provides information about shopper traffic and conversion trends. And the National Retail Traffic Index evaluates department store traffic in general. And when all the location factors are analyzed, the factor that is most critical will be cost. And an estimate of your monthly income and expenses is necessary to determine what location you can afford. So looking at the slide above, this is from Table 6.2 in your book, and it shows the distribution of monthly sales for a women's apparel store. Monthly sales is estimated by multiplying the average sales per square foot by the average number of square feet of selling space. And from that figure, you want to subtract your cost of goods, and then you divide it by 12 to get your monthly sales. And if you look on the example on page 110, the average sales per month that they showed in their example was 12500 So you would need your rent to be significantly lower than that. And you will also have to pay for utilities, taxes, payroll, insurance, and other monthly expenses. So in that example, if average sales were $12,500 and your um, expenses, which would be the utilities, taxes, payroll, were $5,000, and then your lease was $8,000, you would actually be losing $500 per month, per month and making no profit. So you have to have a rent that you can afford and still make a profit. Um, with rent and other expenses taken out of your average sales. So looking at monthly expenses related to the location, I kind of mentioned those in the last slide. Slide these expenses, they vary per location, whether it is a new building or you're purchasing a building or a lease agreement. And the different... Um, Expenses that you will have will be your utilities, which will be electricity, gas, and water. You'll have maintenance, upkeep of um, the property, common fees. Common fees um, can be for maintenance of courtyards, fountains, landscapes for the shopping center. Facility improvements, if you want, you'll have fees if you want to change out the lighting, um, repaint, all those different things, or change anything about the layout. Also, you'll have to pay insurance monthly. You also have to pay property taxes, and then um, you may also have to pay any advertising or promotional costs for the shopping center. So sometimes shopping centers will do advertisements for the whole shopping center, and you'll have to help pay for those. So now if you, you've figured out where you want your location to be, now you have to determine if you're going to build, buy, or lease. So looking at building a facility, this is influenced by the entrepreneur's financial situation. Few people have the funds to build the facility that they want. Some advantages to building, though, are that um, it projects a positive image. You get the image that you want. You're, you have more efficient features to lower, lower your operating cost and increase your productivity. And it can be a profitable investment if it's in good location. 
and sometimes there are few or no existing buildings to meet your needs, so you will have to build. Some disadvantages to building a facility are higher initial fixed costs. Also, the lead time tends to be longer to build a facility, so it's going to be a, lot, a long time before you can get started and make a profit and you're having to put all these costs in. Now looking at buying a facility, and there may be a building that is appropriate that you can buy, and an advantage to buying is that you know exactly what the monthly payments will be, and they will not change like a lease can. But it can also require substantial startup costs, and if you buy the building, it will depreciate, and also you um, have your interest on your loan, and both of those are tax deductible which is two advantages to buying a facility. Um, however, buying may limit your mobility as with the building and if property values fall, you could be in big trouble because you're gonna lose a lot of value in um, your building that you bought in equity. So your last option is to lease a facility. And this provides the most flexibility, the lowest initial cost and the greatest mobility. The disadvantages, though, to leasing a facility are that the property manager may decide not to renew your lease or they can increase your rent, um, which can cause you to relocate, which can also result in a loss of customers. Because remember I said most customers don't travel very far from where they live or where they work. Also, there are usually limitations to remodeling the building, and any lighting or electrical improvements that you make will have to stay with the structure when you move. Um, however, if you can get a long lease that um, cannot be changed at a low cost, that is a great advantage to leasing the facility. However, if you got a lease that was really short and they keep changing the amount of your rent, that would make it a disadvantage. And if you look on page 114 of the book, it talks about suggestions entrepreneurs should consider before signing the lease of the different things that they should look at. Um, this, is, this slide shows um, a chart that can be used and a rating system that's used to determine which location is the best option for your business. And you can use this chart to help you determine which options are best for your business. And when funders are evaluating a business plan, they will examine the plan facility by looking at the initial cost, the value of the property, the equity of the facility, and the potential contributors of the building to the success of the business. So you can go ahead and kind of do part of those things and even more um, through this chart to determine if it's best for you to build, buy, or lease. In the business plan, the entrepreneur will indicate the location of the company's headquarters. They will also list the primary place and address of the business in the business plan. They also include any branch locations, and they also include whether the facility will be constructed, purchased, or leased. They also include a description of the geographical area and community, and a description of the nearby competition. Things that you'll need to provide within your business plan, you'll have to have the square footage and how many square feet is allocated to the office space, the warehouse, and the retail side of your business. You'll also need to discuss the access to parking and transportation for your customers. You also need to talk about the visibility, which is a key factor to the business. And so you need to discuss this in the location sec section of the business plan. And you you also need a copy of the lease or your letter of commitment from your building owner. And two other things that you'll also need to include in your business plan will be to lay out of the interior and the exterior of your building. So we're going to talk about both of those next. So looking at the exterior, customers develop initial opinions of the store before they enter. And that's why the exterior is important to consider. Um, if consumers do not like the exterior of the store, they may not go inside. And consumers can form opinions about your image, price range, quality, and exclusivity before they are inside the store. So the following four exterior vi visual um, factors influence the opinions that consumers form before they enter the retail operation. So first is exterior design. And the exterior... Um, can make you not want to go inside. 
Shoppers rarely remember a retailer's facade in a mall, but they do remember freestanding and strip center and downtown shops facade. And these location shops had the opportunity to use the exterior to create um, an image and vision, visual uniqueness through architecture, location, and signage. And if you look at the picture um, in the slide on the far left, this is of a shopping mall in Paris that has a really cool exterior, which makes me really want to see what it looks like inside. Next are signs, and this is your also includes your logo and your name. And today, most shopping centers are quite plain. So store image is often communicated primarily through the store sign with the company name and logo. And high-end stores tend to have small signs, while department stores tend to have large signs. And specialty stores tend to have logos and graphics in their signs. Next is the approach, and this refers to the surroundings, such as the cars in the parking lot, the landscaping, the common areas, if they're seating areas, the people that are shopping and what they are wearing. They all portray, uh, portray an image um, of what your business is like. Next is the display windows. And this is the last exterior element to influence customers. And this is because that's the last thing the shopper sees before they enter the store and it carries the most weight in the shopper's mind. So the window merchandise should relate to the rest of the merchandise in the store. Different forms of retailers tend to use their um, window displays different, differently. Department stores tend to have more windows that are large, while Tiffany's jewelry store tends to have small windows to create vignettes of beautiful jewelry. And to understand more about how visuals affect store image, you can read, I suggest you read the case study. Um, it's case study 6.1. And it's very helpful to see more information on that. Next, we're going to actually look at the interior variables to consider. And you'll need to plan the interior space because this can affect whether you succeed or not. The following things that you need to consider when planning the interior of your retail store is the first thing is the size of the sales area. The size of the sales area can communicate an image, an open spacious department communicates high end and exclusive and great customer service. And small intimate spaces tend to communicate more of a boutique feeling with unique goods showcased and a high level of service. Um, aisle space is an important thing to think about too because it tends to project the image of higher prices. So you need to look at a balance of merchandise, display, and aisle space to project a certain image and to maximize your sales. Next, you wanna look at the retail layout. And this is the arrangement and method of display of merchandise in the store. And the success depends on a well-designed floor plan. An ideal layout makes it easy for the customer to find merchandise, compare prices, quality, and features, trial merchandise, and make a purchase. You need to put your most profitable potential items in the most trafficked area of the store. So, and this would be your prime selling space. And this is the location with the highest level of customer traffic. And impulse and convenient goods, goods are placed a lot of times in these areas like the cash desk. And new merchandise is placed near the entrance of the store, which is high traffic areas. And non-selling space um, would be your offices, your inventory room, your bathrooms, and your break rooms. And even your changing rooms. The more interior variables to consider are your customer traffic patterns. And some retailers intentionally direct customers through the store by placement of departments or aisles within the store to increase customers' exposure to merchandise. And you want to put items that are purchased the most at the back of your store so you'll walk through the store. So like say you go to a store, you always know that they're going to have their sales at the back because a lot of people go to look for sales and so they're going to have to walk through the store. And you can put your most popular items at the back of the store to get people to walk through the store. You can also use a circular pattern in your store that will also make you walk all the way around the store to find something. Next is space value and each square foot of space in the store generates sales revenue and usually a farther away an area is from the entrance the lower its value is 
and items on the main floor contribute the highest portion of sales. That's why if you go to one of Anthropology's big stores, they always have on like the bottom level or the lower level is where they'll always have their sale items. However, sometimes popular items are at the back of the store, so people will have to walk through the store to see items. So if you think of a grocery store, they always have milk and bread at the back of the store, which are staples, so you'll have to walk through the store and um, see other things on the way. Some retailers use some selling space for entertaining, which is an entertainment area of the store. So an example of this is the Donna Karen's flagship store in Manhattan has a juice bar and a magazine department. Also, the American Girl doll store, most of them have cafes in them, which is a form of entertainment. And the last variable is track planning. And this is a plotted pattern created from observing the movements of your customers in the store and by looking at traffic flow and where consumers pick up, touch, and buy merchandise. And it indicates it's these areas on the floor. And then this is used to maximize your sales potential of your floor space. Now looking at your interior, we're going to look at some different, the four basic floor plans that um, most people use. The first one we're going to look at is the grid layout, which is the bottom one in the slide. And this is where displays are arranged in a rectangular fashion and aisles are parallel to one another. And this layout controls traffic efficiently and creates an organized environment and facilitates shopping by having separate areas for each type. And many discount stores use this layout because it works well with self-service operations to see how it has checkout stands at the front. The next is the freeform layout, which is in the top right corner. And this is more of an informal layout and it uses lot, utilizes displays of varying shapes and sizes. And it creates a certain image of relaxed and friendly shopping, which encourages customers to spend more time in the store and buy more. It also increases impulse purchases and multiple sales in one area. Its major disadvantage is that it can create security problems because it's hard to see some customers in some areas of the store. And it can also sometimes appear disorganized. Next is the boutique layout, which is at the top left. And it divides the store into a series of individual shopping areas, each with its own theme. And it's informal and can create a unique shopping environment. And it allows a retailer to create new departments based on seasonal merchandise trends. And specialty stores usually use this layout. And this is actually the layout that um, Anthropology tends to use. And the last layout is the racetrack layout. And this is where aisles, fixtures, and signing are located to guide you around the store in a large loop. And it is just as it sounds, it sounds as a closed, often oval pathway that people follow. And Kohl's uses this layout. And this um, layout gives customers an outside view of most departments and the associated merchandise selections, and it directs them around the entire store. And the last thing we're going to look at is some more um, interior element display elements. And first we're going to look at lighting. And effective lighting enhances your merchandise selection, such as the picture of the shoes in the slide. And it allows employees to work at maximum efficiencies. So it's saying like different areas of your store may be brighter than others. So like in a jewelry store where the jeweler works on jewelry, it's going to be brighter back there to maximize his efficiency. Um, also, it is an inexp inexpensive investment um, to the overall impact on your appearance and the operation of your store. It and contributes to your store image. Um, really bright lighting makes you think of more a discount retailer many times. And overhead for less fluorescent lights are usually more in discount retailers and they're not good in fitting rooms because they are not flattering and the color changes once in natural lighting. And it's better to use diffused and backlighting in, um, in fitting rooms um, when people are trying things on. So looking at fitting rooms, they play a significant role in sales. They're often not seen as part of the selling space, they're seen as non-selling space, and they tend to be small and dark, but they are 
often where customers make their buying decisions. So they need to be clean, well lit, spacious, convenient, and theft proof, have adequate space to hang merchandise. And it's also great to have a three-way mirror outside in the dressing room. And the main reason you do that is so salespeople can assist people. So they'll come out to the three-way mirror to be able to see, and then they, the sales assistant can help them and help them with the sale. And your fitting room should always be away from exits and be near the sales personnel so not to compromise store security. And the last intro display element is your checkout area, and it needs to be visible to the customer from all vantage points so the sales associate can greet and acknowledge customers when they enter the store. And it should be organized, well lit, and clearly signed and outfitted with the tools to process the sale efficiently. And it's great to have it near an entrance or an exit because it's an extra security point. And this concludes chapter six.